Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last Bruges Group meeting before the general election. Uh, tonight we have three speakers, all of whom unequivocally wish to, for Britain to leave the European Union. Indeed, one of them has actively campaigned to oppose our ever joining the European Union. We also meet at a time of crisis for our institutions and our political parties here in the United Kingdom. Both in the United Kingdom and in continental Europe, the established political parties cannot any longer depend upon the support of their former adherents. For instance, in Scotland, the Scottish nationalists, however incoherent their policies, may well overwhelm the traditional support for the three established political parties. In Greece, Spain and Italy, new parties are gaining ground against the discredited consensus of right and left. In France, the candidate of the National Front leads in the opinion polls for the French presidency. Our speakers tonight not only share a conviction that self-government must be restored to the United Kingdom, they also share a conviction about how our political parties should be organised so that they are vibrant organisations that can respond to the wishes of their members and the aspirations of the nation as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Douglas Carswell. Doug Douglas is the first Member of Parliament in a generation to change his political allegiance and seek the endorsement of his constituents for that change. Douglas is a conviction politician with the ability to get the public to back his convictions. He entered Parliament in 2005 and was the first MP to call for the removal of Speaker Martin. His initiative was not immediately welcomed. And instead, for instance, the ex-Europe minister and convicted felon, Dennis McShane, called for Douglas to be disciplined. In 2009, Douglas tabled a bill calling for a public referendum and Britain's membership, of the, on Britain's membership of the European Union. Since 2010, Douglas has continued to be an assiduous and brave Member of Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a warm welcome to the Member for Clacton, Mr Douglas Carswell. Good evening and, and thank you very much for inviting me along here to address the, the Bruges Group here this evening. Um, this is the very first time that I've addressed the Bruges Group as a UKIP Member of Parliament. But it's not, of course, the, the, the first time I've attended meetings of, of the Bruges Group. Um, I, the very first time I attended the Bruges Group um, was back in the early 1990s. And um, if I remember, uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, had just stood down as, as Prime Minister. I think she had uh, recently said no, no, no to further integration. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's been a long march. It's been a long march, and we're not there yet. But um, I, I think we're getting that. And I, I want to share with you what I think is a, a very optimistic scenario about uh, the change that I think we can achieve um, and the withdrawal from the EU that I think is within our grasp. Um, I'm quite often asked by, um, by people, um, what's it like being UKIP's first 
member of parliament, elected member of parliament. What's it like uh, going into the House of Commons for the very first time as, well, at the time I was in a minority of uh, one against 649. And I can tell you for a stop, not everyone is uh, always best pleased to see me there. Um, there are one or two people, particularly in my old party, who, who look decidedly grumpy whenever I, 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 I go into the chamber, but that's, that's no bad thing. Um, I have practical problems that I have to sort of try and grapple with when I'm in the, in the, in the Commons chamber, well, when I first went there. Like, for example, where on earth was I going to sit? Uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't possibly sit with the Conservatives, I just left them. I didn't want to get too cosy to Ed Miliband and his lot, so where was I going to sit? Well, I decided to sit, uh, I decided to sit where William Gladstone used to sit, on the front benches, on the, what used to be the proper classical liberal side at one time. And um, I don't know if you know, but bagging your seat in the House of Commons, maybe you've seen that program on television, Inside the Commons, bagging your place in the House of Commons means you, you have to, rather curiously, fill in what's called a prayer card and put your name on it. And you have to use that to bag your spot. I think it's a bit like sort of uh, beach towels in Germans. You, 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 you use it to sort of bag your place in the Commons. And I, um, I used this to bag my spot um, where I wanted to sit. And I think it upset one or two, one or two, one or two of my Labour comrades. They, they, they seemed a little bit put out that I dared to sit on, on what they regard as their side. And one of them wrote on my prayer card the letters F-O. <laughs> now, someone told me to look on the bright side. They clearly want me to go to the Foreign Office. So, <laughs> Anyway, um, the European Union. We joined what was to become the European Union. Um, on the basis of, of economics. We were told that joining was going to make us prosperous. Joining was going to help us become richer. Looking across the channel at the disaster that is the Eurozone, who, who seriously argues that anymore? Who seriously believes that more Europe makes us richer? The disaster that is the Eurozone, it's not a tsunami or a natural disaster. It's it's a man-made, a human-made catastrophe for tens of millions of people, particularly in southern Europe, who are reduced to a life of stagnation and, and ever greater poverty because of it. Since 2007, when the financial crisis first manifests itself, uh, the economy of China has grown in terms of output by about 90%. India has grown by about 50%. Even Brazil, which has struggled recently, grow, grew by about 30%. In Europe, the only indices that grow by that amount are those that gauge debt and unemployment. Europe is in a uniquely weak, disastrous economic position, precisely because of the man-made policies that Europe has imposed upon herself. Take a slightly longer-term view. In, in 1992, Europe famously created the, the single market. I remember watching government-sponsored advertisements telling us how this was going to open us up for business. Well, around the same time, by happy coincidence, the United States signed a, a free trade agreement. Just look at which trade bloc's done better. Since 1992, American living standards have rocketed. Output has grown. By almost every conceivable measure of productivity, America is vastly better today. North America is vastly richer and more prosperous for tens of millions more people. Europe, on the other hand, has struggled. That, that, that growth that Europe experienced in the 1950s and the 60s and uh, the 70s, well, it tailed off pretty much around 1992, in fact. Around about the time when we gave bureaucrats in Brussels free reign to create ever more regulations. Europe is gradually being strangled by eurosclerosis, a self-imposed uh, economic weakness caused by trying to do everything by bureaucratic fiat, by grand design. It's a disastrous way to organize the lives of tens of millions of Europeans. Because of that, the European Union, or what became the European Union, has been in decline pretty much from the time we joined. When we joined what was to become the European Union, it accounted for 36% of global output. It looked like the place to be. Today, the European Union accounts for some 25% of global output. And by the mid-2020s, it's forecast we have about 15%. We have chained ourselves to the world's only declining trade bloc. So, so why are we still in? Why are we 
making our foreign policy and our European policy on the basis of assumptions that are a generation out of date, that are redundant, that were proved to be false. Well, I don't think there's any mileage, kilometrage, I should say, in, in blaming Brussels, in bashing Europe. It's a homegrown problem. It's entirely the result of the sclerotic thinking in Westminster. It's entirely a failure of our own political leadership in this country to think up some fresh alternatives. Uh, just, just ask yourself for a moment, how should, forget your politics for a moment, forget whether you prefer the colour red or blue or purple or yellow, just focus on one question. In a democracy, in a political democracy, how should politics work? Politics in a democracy should basically be a competition. A competition for your votes. A competition between different parties with different ideas and different people standing to better represent you. Choice and competition. It raises standards in pretty much every other sphere of life. But when it comes to this country's political system, that choice and competition just isn't there anymore. In seven out of ten seats in this country over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been no realistic chance of the party changing hands during a general election. Up until now, and I, I emphasize this, until now, seven out of ten seats has been a safe seat. In four of the past five elections in this country, fewer than one in ten seats changed hands. In other words, if you're a career politician, if you've got a nice safe seat, you stand a greater chance of losing your seat because of a, a boundary commission redrawing the boundaries or because you fall out with your whip's office or because you're caught by an undercover journalist promising to write a speech for £5,000 a day than because of what the voters think. MPs in this country all too often become MPs by working in the offices of MPs. Yeah. I think there are better qualifications for becoming an MP than obsequiously serving as a special advisor in the office of George Osborne. Yeah. I think it's wrong that a tiny clique of MPs get to decide who to parachute into the safe seats, the fiefdoms. Now, this country's political system once produced some pretty extraordinary and remarkable people. Winston Churchill, who saved this country from fascism. Clement Attlee, founder of the welfare state. An impressive man in a very quiet way, very understated way, but an extraordinarily influential man. Margaret Thatcher, who I think saved this country from socialism. Think about that. Churchill, Attlee, Thatcher. Our political system today produces Ed, Dave, and Nick. I think we can do better than this. Because there's no choice in competition in our politics, there's no fresh thinking. There's no competition of ideas in our political system. On so many of the fundamental issues of the day, if you look at our politicians in Westminster, they basically agree. They basically go along with what you might call the, the Davos man consensus. Take, for example, and I'm going to just counter through them, energy policy. Energy policy in this country today is based on ideas that are out of date. They're based on an assumption that oil was going to become ever more expensive. Well, last time I checked, it was what? $55 a barrel and sinking? Energy policy in this country is made on the assumption that fossil fuel is a dwindling resource. Then along came someone and discovered shale gas. It's based on the assumption that there would be no solar revolution, and yet there's been a solar revolution. Banking policy in this country. You had a bit of a banking bust up on a colossal and catastrophic scale. And what have the Ed, Dave, and Nick show done to change it? Well, the answer is they've all agreed not to do too much. They've agreed to pass more regulatory powers to precisely the sort of regulators who got us into the mess in the first place. Look at immigration policy. Every day in London, millions of people log in and log out when they use the London Underground. Why can't we have a government that can log people in and out when they cross our borders? It's technologically possible. Trade. We've got a political establishment in this country that has chained us to the one trade block that's not growing, the European Union. Why don't we have debates in the House of Commons where we could realign trade so that we could trade where the growth is? And then there's things like defence. Successive governments have allowed our defences to weaken. And all the time they told us 
there wouldn't be global threats and challenges. And now we look and we see those global threats and challenges. We see Russian aircraft flying over Cornwall and we've got very little left to defend ourselves with. This is the lack of vision and verve and imagination and character of the political elite that we produced. I think we can do better than this. Because we have a political system that produces so much mediocrity in terms of, of thinking, the sort of people who become ministers almost have to abandon and give up the idea that they're going to change things. They become ministers precisely because they've shown that they're obsequious to the party leadership and because they've shown that they're willing to put any opinions they may have of their own to one side. And so they walk into their departments and it's like an episode of yes minister that's gone horribly wrong. They end up being the notional head of a vast bureaucracy that carries on doing pretty much what it wants to do. I, I think we can do better than this. As power passes from those we elect into the hands of bureaucrats and Sir Humphreys and technocrats, voters become ever more disillusioned. Voters feel that it doesn't matter who they vote for because it's Tweedledee versus Tweedledum. And we see this growing disillusionment with the political system across the European Union. We see it in this country. We see it in Germany with the rise of the alternative for Germany. And we see it in a rather more sinister and less pleasant form in other countries too. Now, I think it would be lazy to assume that UKIP and the rise of political insurgency in this country has a lot in common with political insurgency in many European countries. And thank goodness UKIP is very different from Podemos and some of the others. UKIP believes in classical liberal ideas, in the free market. It's not a protectionist, angry reaction. The sort of government that they've elected in Greece, I think, will actually probably, it's probably the one thing that will make things even worse for Greece. But I don't think anyone can deny that more European integration is failing because it's, it's left the people behind. It simply doesn't have the democratic legitimacy anymore. Whenever people have been asked, people in Holland and France, to found a member states of the European Union, whether or not they wanted more Europe, the people rejected it. So I think, I think we need change. I think we need to leave the European Union. Now, David Cameron eventually came round to the view that we should have a new deal. And he promised us a new deal. At Bloomberg, famously, a couple of years ago, he, he said he was going to give us a fundamental new deal, followed by an in-out referendum, an opportunity to leave. And no one cheered more loudly than I did when he said that. But I came to realize what he said and what he intends, surprise, surprise, aren't the same. What he has in mind is not a referendum, but a pretenderendum. What he's doing is a smokes and mirrors trick, a conjurer's trick. He wants to do another Wilson. He wants to negotiate a, a deal that he will big up and exaggerate, but which will be of very little fundamental consequence. Now, David Cameron tells us that he's going to strike a new deal, but when you actually listen to some of his own advisers talking, as I did in March last year, it's very clear that what they have in mind isn't designed at a fundamental new deal. It's designed at winning just enough votes at any one moment in time to persuade just enough people to vote to stay in. Everything he's doing is about keeping this country in the European Union. I think we can do better than that. Now, without question, there are good and decent, brave MPs in the House of Commons. And no more so than the 111 brave MPs who in October 2011 voted in defiance of a three-line whip in favour of an in-out referendum. And, and, and Gordon Henderson is, is one of them, and I don't think it should be forgotten. Gordon was prepared to defy his own party on a three-line whip and, and do the right thing. And I think that uh, that needs to be acknowledged and recognised. There are 111 MPs who are willing to do the right thing. But the problem is the sofa gap, the clique at the top of the party. I came to realise that whatever I did in the division lobbies and whatever I said, the clique at the top of the party, they're just not serious about change. They're just not serious about changing things. 
Everything they do when they talk about change in our relationship with Europe is change so that things can stay the same. Only UKIP can get us real change. Only UKIP eating into the market share of the established parties can force them to even begin to talk about doing the right thing. Everything they're doing is a response to the rise of UKIP and to the fact that more and more people are seeking out a real alternative. Now, I just want to finish, if I may, in the last minute by talking about the referendum. I know that there's an election coming and we're all rightly focused on that, but at some point in the future, I think we're all going to have to try and unite if we want to leave the European Union, regardless of what colour rosettes we wear in May, in order to try to win. I think there's going to be a referendum at some point between 2016 and 2020. It's been a long march, as I said at the beginning. We need to make certain that we win it. And I think to do that, it's absolutely vital that we argue optimistically for change, that we frame the debate not as becoming little Englanders, but as about leaving the world's only declining trade bloc so that we may trade more openly with the world. We need to offer sunshine and optimism and not, not pessimism. As I said, it, it's been a very long march for the Bruges Group and for many of you to get to the referendum. We need to make absolutely certain that when that referendum comes, we broaden our appeal. We make arguments that appeal not just to ourselves, not just to people who come to the Bruges Group, but to the widest number of people in this country whose support we're going to need to get us out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Douglas. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Gordon Henderson, a Member of Parliament for Sittingbourne and Sheppey, which he gained on a 13% swing in 2010. Gordon began work in the retail sector, then moved to Southern Africa before returning to take up a senior appointment with Marconi. In the House of Commons, he has put his knowledge of the private sector to good use, serving on the Regulatory Reform Select Committee. Gordon has also served as a Kent County Councillor on the Kent Police Authority and has been the agent for the Thanet North constituency. He is a supporter of the Better Off Out campaign and he has stated that the non-conservative politician that he admires most is Nigel Farage. Gordon. But that's not to say I think he's right. He's just a very, very good politician who has transformed a party uh, into what he terms a non-political party when it's the most political party we've got in this country. So he's very clever politician, and that's why I admire him. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, support some of his policies. Uh, Douglas and I go back a long way. Um, I was thinking about it today, actually, because uh, when we were both desperately trying to find a, a, a seat to fight at the 2001 general election, we both made it through to the final round in Luton South. Uh, Unluckily for me, I won and uh, got through, and I was the candidate in, in Luton South, and uh, came a dismal 12,000 votes behind the Labour Party. Douglas found a, a, a better seat uh, out in East Anglia, and is still the MP there. I mention that also because um, at about that time, I think it was 2000 or 2001, I actually was privileged to march down Whitehall and into uh, a protest meeting in um, Trafalgar Square at which Lord Stoddard was the guest speaker um, when we were at that time pro uh, campaigning to keep the pound. Uh, my Euroscepticism goes back to before UKIP was even 
thought of. It goes back to uh, 1984, and it, the, the chairman mentioned that I was the Conservative Party um, agent in Thanet North. And I was tasked that year, in 1984, with being the agent in the area for the European Union candidate, um, who was Christopher Jackson, the MEP at that time for East Kent. I remember he, uh, um, Christopher turning up in Margate one day, and I, the very first time I met him, and I said, OK, Christopher, look, I've been tasked with actually acting as your agent and getting you elected. But I have to tell you, I'm doing it with a very heavy heart, so I think you're a waste of space. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, look, we don't need a European Parliament, and I don't see why I should be busting a gut to get you elected to it. And that's the fundamental problem I have with the European Union. I'm a great, as a businessman, being in business on and off in all sorts of spheres since I was 16 when I left school. I never went to grammar school, I never went to university. Uh, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, as you can probably tell from my speech. You know, I'm a boy from Medway who um, started in Woolworths sweeping the floor and cleaning up dog mess. And that's literally what I did for the first six months of my working life. I got my hands dirty. But I believe in business. I believe in the free market. I believe in ensuring that we have open borders in terms of trade and in some instances in labour as well because we can't have that you cannot have an open market in trade without having an open market in labour it simply doesn't work but we'll come to that in a moment i believe in a free market i believe in a european market i believe in cooperation in europe that's what i signed up and i'm one of the one of those in this room, I'm sure, that uh, remembers the, the, the referendum when we decided whether we wanted to join the economic European community. And I did, because as a businessman, I thought it was a good thing. And I still think it's a good thing. Where I started to go sour on the European project was when all of a sudden they decided they were going to change its name to the European Union. No one ever asked me that. No one ever asked you that. They, no one ever asked anybody. Why should they change it to the European Union? And once they started having a European Union, with the European Parliament, it automatically assumes, it automatically meant that we were going to lose some of our sovereignty. We're going to lose some of our powers. And that is fundamentally what I find is wrong with the European Union. Now, as Douglas said, David Cameron has said that he will negotiate or renegotiate our terms with Europe. And I think he genuinely believes he can do that. Um, I think he's a fantasist, because I don't actually think he can do that. He might come back waving a bit of paper saying, we have renegotiated this tremendous deal. But the renegotiation, and I mentioned this at a better off out meeting we had only this week, the renegotiation is actually in red herring. In many ways it's irrelevant to us that want to see our exit from Europe. What it... But even if it comes back with nothing, even if it comes back with no renegotiation, or if it pretends there's, a re there's been a proper renegotiation, the thing about it is he is committed to, and he has to be committed to, because he would not survive as leader of the Conservative Party if he went back on it. He is committed to putting that renegotiation, whatever it is, however good or bad it is, to an in-out referendum in this country. And that's what we are pushing for. So I don't care whether he, what he pretends to renegotiate. It is then down to those of us who believe we are better off out of Europe to argue the case and get people on our side to actually have that referendum and win that referendum. Now, I support much of what Douglas stands for. I support much of what UKIP stands for, only because UKIP stands for what I believe in and what I've always believed in, but the one thing I do disagree with them on, I, don't, I think Douglas would probably agree with me with this. One thing I disagree with them is this. I think leaving Europe or not leaving Europe, it's not down to Cameron, it's not down to Clegg, it's not down to Miliband, it's not even down to Farage. It's not down to me, it's not down to Douglas. It's down to the British people. And you can only do that in a referendum. We have a long... Um, and very good tradition in this country that any constitutional changes we make to, 
to, to this country is put to a referendum, whether that be trying to, the Liberals trying to change the voting system to an AV job, whether it's changing, uh, uh, allowing the Scots to have a referendum on, uh, uh, on uh, independence. Any, we always have that. That's the only way you can actually decide real constitutional change. You can't do it at a general election, because once we, we go down that slippery slope of saying, ah, because we won the election and we stand for this, which is what the Labour Party have done on too many occasions, as they did with the, the uh, Lisbon Treaty, they said they wouldn't have a, a, a referendum because we said we weren't going to have one, therefore we won't have one, because we've been elected. That's a very slippery slope. And unfortunately, this is where I, fall, I, I, I disagree with UKIP's position, because they say they won't have a referendum if they became a government, which they never will. But if they, ever, if they were miraculously to become a government in May, uh, they have said they wouldn't have a referendum. I think that's fundamentally undemocratic for such a very important constitutional issue. And yes, they can turn around and say, ah, oh, yeah, but everyone knows we're, we're opposed to Europe and everyone knows we want to leave the European Union. But in this country, and the way we operate in this country, it is possible, as it was at the last election or the election before that, for a party to win government with only 40% of the people who actually voted. Not, not the electorate, just 40% of the 60% or 65% who actually voted. So therefore, you would be deciding a very important constitutional question on um, issues that might not... That, I mean, UKIP might well win the election in seats because of its immigration policy. Nothing to do with Europe. I had somebody contact me after the European Union, uh, at European elections, and say, Gordon, just to let you know I actually voted UKIP um, because I'm, I like the immigration uh, policies. I'm a Lib Dem supporter who's, who's a passionate Europhile. Now, th that's the point. We cannot assume that because you win an election that all of your policies um, are rather stamped automatically. They are not. So I, that's, where I fall, I, that's where I disagree on you, Captain Wynne. I was asked to join them. That was the one deciding factor that decided me not to join them because I think it's deeply undemocratic. I just wanted to talk briefly... Uh, and Chairman, if I waffle on too long, please just give me the wink, won't you? Um, just briefly about uh, why I am and where I am and where I've come from, because I think that's very important when it moulds what we believe in. Uh, I mentioned that I stood in uh, Luton South in uh, 2001, and I campaigned strongly for us to keep the pound, because if you remember, that was the campaign at that time. After 2001, we'd actually fought a very good campaign in, in Luton South, uh, to such an extent the Labour Party was so worried that they actually, uh, and this is absolutely true, they actually brought in the uh, Prime Minister of Kashmir so that he could talk to all the Kashmiris living in Luton, and they would, the, the word went out from the mosques, you will vote Labour because they were frightened that I was going to win. I don't think I would. I couldn't have overturned a 12,000 majority, but, hey, it, it can happen. So uh, I thought I did very well. After that election, I was removed from the approved list of candidates for the Conservative Party because of my Eurosceptic views and, and because uh, I'd fallen out with the local regional um, organiser over issues relating to uh, the Vauxhall plant in, in, in Luton. But that's another story. I was removed from the, uh, the, the list, the approved list. Um, but my own constituency, the constituency I wanted to stand in all along, the constituency I lived in for 30 years, down in Sittingbourne and Sheppey, uh, persuaded central office. They said that they wouldn't uh, accept anybody else unless they allowed me to go on the list. So I was put back on the list um, to... Uh, uh, but I was only allowed to stand uh, to apply for that particular seat which I did. And in 2005, I fought another good election, I think, and uh, I, I was up against a Labour majority of 3,500. Uh, and I won that election with a majority of 118 votes. Uh, and then there was a recount, and an hour later, I wasn't the MP for City of Morning because I lost by 79 votes. Um, which I still think, at the time, was a very good, um, a, a really good um, result. I was removed from the approved list of candidates yet again uh, because I had insisted that on my election leaflets I put that I was a member of the Better Off Out campaign and I wanted to leave Europe. 
uh, and the regional director, who happened to be pro-Europe, uh, put in a very bad report about me and said I, I wasn't a, a very good campaigner. Um, once again, my, my association came to the rescue like the, the, the 5th Cavalry and said that uh, uh, whilst we were being at that time dictated to by central office who said they wanted an A-lister to be interviewed and four A-listers duly turned up uh, on our doorstep, but my association said, well, they, they don't mind interviewing them, but they want to interview me as well. So uh, they had to give in and I was reinstated and, um, and I then became the candidate yet again. Um, in the 2010, uh, I had a 12,383 majority, which must tell you something about people uh, understanding what I stood for. Uh, and that actually made me pretty bloody minded, having been removed from the list twice. So I've always been, and I mentioned all this because I wanted to, uh, I'm not one of those people that jump on the bandwagon, uh, as, uh, as sadly some of my colleagues do. Um, uh, I've been a long-standing uh, Eurosceptic. And so I think that I can speak from some, um, with some history. I like to think myself, though, of a, pragmatic, a pragmatic Eurosceptic. I don't believe that we should automatically vote against everything. In fact, I often don't vote. I mean, if you check the record of my, my votes, I either vote... Uh, uh, I generally vote no against it. As a matter of principle, I'd vote no against it. If, something, if I listen to something, I think, you know, that makes a little bit of sense. Since we're here, since we're in, we might as well go along with it. So I, I, I might support it. But in the main, um, on, often I don't bother to vote because I think, why are we voting? You know, we shouldn't even be discussing things about Europe. So that, that's, that's my stance on, 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 on Europe. I think that um, what we've got to do is we've got to be pragmatic. We've got to work out now what would happen if we do leave the European Union. And it's very important because you know, we, those of us, I don't know whether everybody in this room feels the same way as I do, which, which is we are, we're better off out of Europe. Uh, but not everyone believe, believes that. Not everyone agrees with that. You know, I talk to lots of businessmen in my, in my, my constituency. And whilst they all support me, they say to me, look, Gordon, you know, I'm a bit... I am a bit nervous about leaving, leaving Europe, and I have to explain to them, this is where we've got to get the message over. Look, um, don't be put off by saying that people saying, well, if we lose, leave Europe, uh, the Europeans are going to stop buying for us. Of course they're not going to stop buying for us. And there's one very, very good reason why they're not going to stop buying from us. Because we buy from them. And we buy from them more than they buy from us. So the Germans aren't going to stop selling us Mercedes-Benz. The French aren't going to stop selling us red wine and cheese. The Italians aren't going to stop selling us pasta. They're going to carry on doing that. And they know it's a two-way thing. And they will be delighted to buy things from us because they buy things from us because we make the best products in Europe, apart from the German cars, of course. So uh, those people that say that if we leave, leave Europe, we are going, business is going to uh, lose that are wrong. We will have to have different arrangements. We will have to negotiate uh, with each country a, a trade agreement. But I don't think it's beyond the width of... Uh, the, the, those very, very clever civil servants in Whitehall to negotiate with all these different countries. And I think that the, the, uh, the, the European uh, countries that are left, if there is a European Union, and by the way, as, as Douglas mentioned, you know, problems in Greece, we could see the whole, the whole facade come tumbling down in the next five or six years. Um, I, I hope we don't, because I actually hope that we can have a European, the, the original concept of uh, an open market in Europe, which is a fantastic trading um, uh, marketplace, um, is fine. And that's what, I, I'm happy, look, I, I'm, I'm a Eurosceptic and I'm, a, I'm somebody who wants to come out of Europe, but I'm happy, I can tell you, I'm happy to have a European Commission. I've got no problem with one. I have no problem with having commissioners representing the, the, the nation states determining to ensure that all of the rules relating to an open market are, are, are kept to, I've got no problem with that, because if you have an open market, you've got to have it, you've got to police it. And the only way you can police it is by having a, 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 some sort of bureaucracy in place. Don't mind that, as long as that is controlled as bureaucrats from the nation states. Where I draw the line, I'm going back to where I started, where I draw the line is having a European Parliament. Because a European, once you've got a European Parliament, and you've got a European anthem, and you've got a European flag, 
then you've got a European country. And that, of course, is what the Europhiles want. They want the United States of Europe. I don't, and I will fight long and hard to ensure we don't get it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that, Gordon. Now, our third speaker is Lord Stoddart of Swindon. For me, Lord Stoddart has an impeccable political pedigree. Public service began for him in 1952, when he was elected to Reading Borough Council. He served as a councillor for 20 years, and for the last seven years as leader of the council. That was at a time when being leader of a council carried considerable responsibilities. Councils had powers and responsibilities that had not been curtailed by Whitehall. David Stoddard had considerable power and responsibilities for the well-being and development of Reading itself. In 1970, at the second attempt, David entered Parliament as the Member of Parliament for Swindon. There were no spads at that time. Political parties have always benefited from having bright young intellectuals like Peter Shaw or John Biffin. But the advent of youthful pole climbers with identical backgrounds who now control our political parties is a profoundly retrograde step. In the House of Commons, David served his party and his constituency in a number of capacities, including being in the Labour Whip's office while the Callaghan government struggled to maintain a majority. No job for a political virgin. Following his defeat at the 1983 general election, David Stoddart was elevated to the House of Lords. Again, he served his party in many capacities. But eventually, the twists and turns of new Labour became too much. In 2001, he was expelled for backing a socialist candidate in St Helens, rather than the Tory defector, Sean Woodward. Today, Lord Stoddart is one of the Upper House's most diligent and effective members. He is usually one of the last to leave before beginning his journey home to Reading. His flow of written questions, usually on the subject of the European Union, continually exposes the deficiencies of our membership. When I saw David last Tuesday, I asked him whether he might be referring to that great speech of Hugh Gates schools, when he said that if we joined the common market, we would be saying goodbye to a thousand years of British history. How right he was. He must have foreseen developments like the European arrest warrant. And when I put that to David, he replied, well, I probably was there. Ladies and gentlemen, will you give a warm welcome to Lord Stoddart of Swindon? Well, thank you, Barry. But how on earth am I going to live up to that? It's very nice of you, and. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yes, of course it's all true. And I would add one thing, that in those days, leaders of the council didn't get paid. They did it for nothing. But um, let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to take you back, uh, back a bit in history. Um, I've been around this issue 
for 53 years. 53 long years. And I made my first speech in 1962, the same year as that great man, Gateskill, told us exactly what the Treaty of Rome was about and what the future was about, and that this country was going to lose a thousand years of history. And I made my first speech when I was the candidate for Newbury. Um, a very safe Tory seat, I must say, and it was made in Woolhampton in Berkshire. And I've made so many speeches since that I forget the number. But when I speak to the House of Lords, which is becoming full now of ex-commissioners and ex-MEPs, I always make one thing absolutely clear. I tell them that I was against joining the European community or the common market as it then was, and that I believe that Britain would thrive outside it. And the third thing I say to them is that this issue transcends party politics. It is about who governs Britain. And it's always been about that. And unfortunately, um, politicians have allowed themselves, God knows why, to be swayed by the idea that Britain is no longer able to govern itself. And of course it all started with Mr Heath. Let's not forget Mr Heath. Um, because uh, he asked um, in 1970 for Let's, let's see what he said. He said he wanted a mandate to negotiate. No more and no less. And that he wouldn't join the common market without the full-hearted consent of the British people. That's what he said. That's what he said. And he um, fooled his own party and fold the rest of the country. And when we had the second reading of the bill, and I was there voting against the bill, the result was 309 to 301. Hardly the full-hearted consent of the British people. And of course, there was no referendum. And we joined um, in on the 1st of January in 1973. Unfortunately, even then, we had a sleepy parliament, most of whom had not read the Treaty of Rome, because had they read it, they would know what the future has become. I don't know what that is, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so... so um, it, 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 um, it was a sleepy parliament, as I say, and they hadn't read the um, treaty. Um, but there is actually a mistaken belief that we did have a referendum. But the only referendum we had was whether we should stay in the common market. And, um, of course, that referendum was brought about because there was a big split in the Labour Party. Um, and uh, uh, some strange things were said around that time. And I've got a quotation here from one of the politicians, a leading politician. In fact, he was the Labour leader at the time. Uh, Labour's leader is under no illusions as to what EEC membership will mean to the next Labour government. Writing last year in the New Socialist, Neil Kinnock made it clear that we cannot continue to tolerate the continued outflow of investment and employment imposed by membership without any compensating improvement in our trade. That was Neil Kinnock. He's, now he says, of course, that if the facts change, 
uh, you'll have to change with them. But the facts haven't changed. They're exactly the same now as they were then. And uh, it's getting worse, I'm afraid. And, of course, there was um, this referendum. And um, Wilson was the Prime Minister. And, of course, the government, here it is, sent out the paper, I keep these things by me in case I need them, and I need them for the night. This is the government New Deal in Europe. And Wilson promised that he had renegotiated the treaty. And he says this, there was a threat to employment in Britain from the movement in the common market towards an economic and monetary union. This could have forced us to accept fixed exchange rates for the pound, restricting industrial growth and so putting jobs at risk. This threat has been removed. Well, we know that that was a lie because we got economic and monetary union and what a disaster it has been for those who joined it. So that you can't really believe what politicians tell you at one stage. And of course the British people were fooled into uh, voting to remain in, although I have to say that a third of the electorate said they wanted to come out. Um, so no significant changes were really made, and the British people, in, a, in, 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 act, in actual fact, um, the, the British people were misled at that uh, particular point. I mean, I myself, quite frankly, and many others, uh, were so distraught about it that we predicted that there would be rioting in the streets. And, of course, we were laughed out of court, except that we were right. There's been rioting in the streets in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, as we actually predicted. And there will be more, make no mistake about that. Um, so the conduct of the, refer of the refer referendum was, in fact, a mistake. Uh, sorry, I'm getting old. I am old. Um, <laughs> um, what, what, what I was going to say was that the, uh, the, the uh, campaign was a disgrace. The Yes campaign had all the people, um, or all the big people with them, uh, and the No campaign had very little. They had little backing. Um, the Yes campaign had 20 million pounds behind them and they were supported by the Labour government, by the Tories, the Liberals, the multinationals, virtually all the national newspapers, the BBC and the CIA. So that, 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 that was the, uh, that was the um, uh, support that the Yes campaign got. Um, people now come and say to me, um, we're winning. They say, David, we're winning. I wish I could be sure of that. Um, but remember, the same old people as were around in 1975 are still there. Remember, they're still there, preaching that Britain could not survive outside the European Union um, and they have been joined by the President of the United States and of course the bishops. The bishops have recommended the new, in the new um, in such a, what, what is it they call it um, but anyway they recommend uh, that there should be further uh, integration and of course they've also said that a living wage should be paid to everyone. But of course they're not paying it themselves. <laughs> and I would recommend the bishops to read Matthew 7.3, I think it is. It's something about the moat in thy brother's eye and the beam in thine own eye. So um, before they speak, they probably ought 
to think. Um, and, of course, other institutions will uh, wear. We're going to have the same old lies being told about three million people at stake. That's already been dealt with. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's been blown apart anyway by our previous speakers tonight and also by a lot of uh, many pamphlets, including uh, the Bruges Group and others. The same old insults are being thrown at us. In 1975, we were ignorant little Englanders, and horror of horrors, we were Benites. You know, Mr. Ben, in actual fact, got the referendum by fighting for it. Um, today, we are still called little Englanders, and even worse, Cameron, he thinks that we're loonies, fruitcakes, and posit racists. Um, uh, who is it? Michael Howard, I think, thinks we are cranks, gadflies, and extremists. And now, uh, and of course, Tony Blair thinks we are unpa unpatriotic. <laughs> thinks we are actually unpatriotic because we believe in Britain and being governed by ourselves. Um, and now we have Mr. Bowles. Mr. Bowles, who thinks that um, people like us are Luddites. Perhaps he's forgotten who the Luddites were. He seems to have a bad memory, because he couldn't remember the name of any businessman who had made donations to the Labour Party. Now I like helping people out. So let me help him out and give him just one name. John Mills. John Mills, a lifetime member of the Labour Party, a highly successful businessman, donated £1.65 million to the Labour Party last year. Now you'd think he would remember something. But there we are. He forgets who gives him 1.6 million pounds. Now, I don't think any of us in this room would forget that. I would be. Um, but there we are. He, John Mills um, uh, is a well-known Eurosceptic. He's the, uh, he's the secretary of the Labour Party um, uh, the committee uh, against Europe. And uh, he's the co-chairman of Business for Britain. But Mr. Bowles forgets all about him. Now, if that's the way he treats his benefactors, God help us all if he ever becomes Chancellor of the Exchequer. So, um, both, but, but these people are uh, the very same people who are urging us to join the Eurozone and scrap the pound. Again, they predicted disaster if we didn't join, um, that we uh, would run up on the rocks, that we'd be sidelined, we wouldn't have a place in the world. You know it, you know it all, they've said it all. But of course, there has been a disaster. Not in Britain, but in the Eurozone. That is a complete and utter disaster. Um, if we join, we would now be wallowing in low or no growth, high unemployment, falling living, living standards, and um, ways must be found to counter their influence. Because they still, unfortunately, although they are horribly wrong, they still have influence in high places. Now, I've referred to the past because it impinges on the present and the future. At present, the Labour Party and the Liberals are in favour of staying in, come what may. Mandelson believes that we will join um, the single currency. We learn nothing. He still thinks that we should join the single currency. What do you make of people like that? I mean, I don't know what to make them. Perhaps you can. Um, so there's no firm commitment to a referendum by them. 
the Scots and Welsh Nats have announced that they will campaign to stay in. And of course UKIP um, is the uh, single party of any note uh, that will campaign to come out. Um, Cameron is, uh, is committed to an in or out referendum after negotiation uh, for reform. But what does that mean? First of all, is there any reform possible? I very much doubt it. I can't think of any way in which the European uh, Commission and the other nation states are going to give us anything that would be worthwhile. Um, after all, but, I mean, what, 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 what does he believe in? Uh, he sees the EU as a beacon of freedom and democracy, a guarantor of peace and a successful economic, financial and trading entity. He believes that the EU should extend from the Atlantic to the Euros. And um, he believes also that Turkey should be admitted to the EU. Well, now, does anybody really believe all that he thinks about Europe? I mean, uh, the very reverse is true. It's not democratic, it's not progressive, um, and it really is falling apart. But they're keeping it together, whatever happens. Um, and Turkey, I looked up the figures. I think per people generally think that Turkey is just a small little country with no importance. It's got a population of 77 million. The religion is 96% registered Muslim. And per capita income is 12,200 per annum. Their armed forces are 423,000. 315,000 in the army, 48,000 in the navy, air force 60,000. Now compare that with our little army uh, that we've got. And uh, what it really means is that Turkey is going to be one of the leading countries, in fact the leading country by the time they got in, uh, in the European Union with a Muslim po uh, population uh, of uh, about 70 million. Just imagine the changes that are going to happen throughout. And yet, um, the Prime Minister wishes them to join the EU. So, you know, just exactly what does he believe? I really want to believe that um, if, if we have a, a Cameroon government, that he could negotiate something. But I'm certain that he can't. And I wish that if that happened, he would recommend withdrawal. That's what I'd like him to be able to do, and I'm sure everybody else in the room would like him to do. He's not going to do it. I've asked five questions asking whether if the government doesn't get what they want, the results from negotiation, will they recommend withdrawal? And they will not answer that question. So that means that it's, um, it's another fib. You know, whatever happens, they're not going to come out. They believe that our place is there and that's where they want us uh, to uh, stay. But... Um, the other thing about it is this, that they believe, and they have said, that the Eurozone should um, have further integration by being responsible for fiscal policy. And indeed, that's been confirmed by the governor of the Bank of England. So while they are saying, on the one hand, that there shouldn't be further integration, they are recommending further integration within the Eurozone. Now, you can't have it both ways. And I fear that they understand perfectly well that if, this, if the Eurozone has fiscal policy, then eventually the, we will have to join it. 
And I think that's the trick. Um, but of course there's no certainty that we'll have uh, a referendum at all. Uh, the general election could bring about a situation where even if the Tories become the largest party, um, a referendum bill in Parliament could be defeated uh, by the opposition parties um, combining to defeat it. So don't believe that we are certain to have a referendum. Um, the general election could upset all that. Um, however, let us assume that we do have an in-out referendum. Um, we will be up, the, up against all the people and organizations that I've already mentioned. Um, but events also have a part to play. And they are being, being played out just at this very moment in Ukraine. And the Ukraine is being used to frighten people into believing that Russia is about to invade the Baltic states and take over the whole of Ukraine. Now, that's what they are telling us. Um, Russophobia is being, uh, Russophobia is being stoked up and uh, Putin is being demonized. Now, the result of that goes... Out of that, and they know it, is likely to be that voters will seek security by remaining in the EU. There is another factor, and you know it's all been very cleverly done. There is another factor, and that is in 19. In, in, just tell her how old I am when I go back to the uh, 20th century. 19th century, well, 20th century, um, that in 2017, the United Kingdom will hold the presidency of the EU with all the razzmatazz that goes with it, and the Europhiles will use it to engrandize the EU, um, and that we are essential, an essential part of it. So, you know, these things are done uh, they're thinking ahead, they're planning their campaign at the present time. The Eurorealist uh, campaign will not have the resources of, this, of these stay in us, um, but we do have the soul of truth about the reality of the EU, and we should wield it. And um, a lot of this is being done at present by a number of people and organizations, as I've already said, including the Blues Group. Uh, we must and can show also uh, how Britain can thrive as a free and independent democratic nation outside the clammy, uh, stifling embrace of the authoritarian corporate state, which is the European. We can do it. We can thrive. We did it. We've done it for hundreds of years. We built an empire. We gave it away, but we're still a significant country in the world. Freed of its stifling laws and legislation, um, coupled with the ability to make our own trade deals to help our commerce and industry to thrive without having to ask the Brussels uh, Commission, asking them position, uh, permission to help our uh, industry, um, to cease paying a gross annual tribute of over £20 billion pounds a year, you know, what other country pays them £20 billion pounds a year to trade with them? Because that's what it means. America, everybody else, um, the Swiss, they trade with them without having to pay them a penny. And we are paying them £20 billion pounds a year gross. Um, and it helps also, of course, to pay for an overbearing bureaucracy and subsidizing basket case nations. Uh, we would once again have a British foreign policy and have control of our borders and who should be allowed to settle here. Um, we would be able to decide our own budget without first having to submit it to Brussels. People don't understand that we have to submit our budget to Brussels. 
before Parliament sees it. That's how far it's got. Um, and we could decide all our tax rates without, um, without uh, asking for their consent. Just think of what we could do with 20 billion to help our own people. And after all, you know, that's what members of Parliament are elected for. They're not elected to give um, taxpayers money, ad lib, to anybody else, to countries outside here, while cutting um, benefits and holding down wages in this country. Um, and finally, we would have our laws made transparently by our own elected parliament and not by committees of bureaucrats sitting in secret and a polyglot council sitting in a, sitting in a foreign capital. We'd be able to govern ourselves, in other words. The world is where we should be. The world is out there with its 7.5 billion customers. Not 500 million 7.5 billion customers um, and they want to buy our goods. That is the prize of independence which we could have if we had leaders who believed in Britain and its people. I don't think we've got them in Parliament. I think we've got them here and I think we've got the people out there and that is the task that we have before us um, in case we have an election, uh, a referendum in 2017. Thank you very much. We've had three tremendous speeches from our speakers, and now it's your opportunity to put your questions. Indeed. Robin, Lord Stoddart, who governs Britain? This is the question. It appears to be a constitutional question. And so my question to you is, who should be able to vote in a European Union in or out referendum? Should Germans, French, Spanish, Polish people, Indians, Pakistanis, Somalis? Uh, who should be able to vote? Should English people not be able to vote as to who governs Britain? Thank you. Well, I think the answer is simple. Oh, stop. Um, I don't think uh, you could have one. Um, that's the position of the present time, that only British British citizens um, at home and abroad, in okay, most cases. Uh, and that's how it should be. But there are some people today who believe that referendum should be held in Europe wide. And they do that, of course, because they know that um, uh, they are bound to win it. But basically, the referendum will be by British people, the United Kingdom. Uh, but uh, uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, the Scots and the Welsh, um, and the Welsh certainly, who voted uh, no in the last referendum, are now going to advise people who voted yes, which is most of I think it was Douglas that said that uh, Roger Andrew, I think it was Douglas that said that uh, people in the country generally need to understand the issues. And I think it's been very difficult to win an in hand referendum because the history of referendums in this country is that people vote for the tend to vote for the status quo because there's so much uncertainty and people are afraid of the alternative. But what people in this country don't understand is the Eurozone in particular, the European Union, is a failure. And I think, frankly, Bruce Group and all of you are failing to make the British public aware of what a mess it is. We 
look, 25% unemployment increase in Portugal, 50% youth unemployment, and nobody blames the European Union, and nobody blames the, European, uh, the Eurozone. Why not? Thank you. That was, and I, I, you, you suggested that some of us aren't doing our bit to draw the uh, iniquities of the European Union to the public's attention. Well, I, I sort of gave up a career in fund management and resigned the seat and triggered a parliamentary by-election and stood in a general election and did one or two things precisely because I, I wanted to highlight the fact that we would be better off out. Um, and um, some of us have been doing that for, for, for quite some time and quite determinedly and, and, and no organisation more so than the Bruges Group. And I, I, I don't think we should uh, beat ourselves up too much. I think uh, uh, we are making great progress. There's always room for you to come and leave it in Clacton if you would like to help do more. Uh, the question you put was about people voting in referendums. And uh, if I could just correct one thing that um, Gordon said. Gordon suggested that UK's position is that we shouldn't have an in-out referendum, and, and that's absolutely and emphatically incorrect. UK's position is that we should have an in-out referendum, and our preference would be for an in-out referendum, followed by invoking Article 50, but of course bearing in mind that we would also have the nuclear option of, of unilateral withdrawal if we didn't get what we wanted, when we wanted it. Um, now, it's true that if you are proposing change, in a referendum, it is a harder argument to make than if you're voting, or if you're advocating to uh, retain the status quo. A a absolutely. But if it's really the case that everything after um, what Solar said and everything we've known about the European Union for the past 40 years, if it is the case that we cannot win a majority of our countrymen to agree that we should leave, then you know we, we have to be Democrats about it. We have to accept. Um, the, the verdict of the people. You can't, on the one hand, call for a referendum and then uh, say that somehow it's, it, it, it's not legitimate. I, I happen to think, actually, that the wisdom of the crowd, uh, the popular view on, on most things in this country, is better than that of the opinions of the 650 MPs that I've read in this I think we have to trust the judgment of the people. Now, if I just finish with one point, when people say, ah, the public vote for the status quo, I put it a slightly different way. The public votes against, generally speaking, grand designs of politicians, and there's no grand design of the politicians in the European project. I think we can win, I think we will win, but in order to win, we have to make sure that we frame the debate in a way that, as, as Rob Solop said, it advocates change for the better, rather than uh, the rejection of the modern world. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'll take a question from, from the gentleman yesterday, who might share this, he's last lecture, if you could just stand up. Uh, Andrew Smith, uh, framing, in terms of framing like Doug, Douglas and perhaps for all the speakers, uh, you did it by far the best known advocate for leading the European Union, and freedom associations all that too uh, in their marvellous ways. But you give it surely the best known uh, speaker as a UK member. Uh, is UKIP doing enough to frame the debate and to say how we would leave what the alternative would be? Recent survey polls suggest that the public are hesitant because they don't know what the alternative is. I speak in schools for Civitas, and many of the students there ask me what is the alternative, uh, because they haven't ever heard an alternative. And I give them my version. I wonder if UKIP or other groups such as Blue Group are giving an adequate alternative now, not in the referendum. Yeah. It, it, when the referendum comes, it's important that we reflect on the fact that UKIP will be part of a coalition. I think it's absolutely vitally important that we have people like Will Sodar from the uh, centre left, and there's a good, honourable tradition in this country of uh, political radicalism on, on the left. We have a broad coalition. Just, just look at the opinion polls. If it's uh, UKIP contra Mundo uh, in the referendum, um, the Mandelson side will win. We need to broaden out and create a coalition of people from across the political spectrum who believe in the overriding need for democratic self-determination. Um, is UKIP doing enough to um, help? The argument, sir, you're very welcome to come to Clacton and help me with our leaflets and say what the alternative looks like. And one of the ways in which we're doing this is, if, for example, immigration. Many people feel very pessimistic about, about, about this issue because successive governments have promised change and never really delivered it. And what the official statistics say is going to happen and what actually happens is two different things. But, but look at UKIP's policy as beautifully put forward by uh, Stephen Wolfe. 
um, he's not simply saying we're against something. He's offering an Australian-type points-based system that is actually fair, that is actually, um, I, I, I think, reasonable, and is actually, I think, compared to the alternative policies put forward by the mainstream parties, we don't want any controls on the right of 400 million people to live here. I, I, I think pretty, pretty reasonable. So that is a good example of, of UKIP advocating what the alternative could be if we were outside the European Union. There's more that can be done, but you know, um, come, come and help push out those leaflets in Clacton. I'm already standing here. I wonder if you want to come and talk to him. So I'd like to thank uh, Douglas for clarifying the position of UKIP uh, and referendum. Perhaps you would like to tell my local, your yet local uh, UKIP people in my constituency who have categorically told me it's UKIP policy not to have one, the UKIP government wouldn't do it. So I'm delighted if you could tell them that. In terms of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the other issues that, that were raised, um, I think that, uh, and I, I agree with what Douglas says about immigration, for instance. I actually think that uh, the people I talk to in my constituency, and I have a constituency that is concerned about immigration, even though we have one of the lowest percentages of immigrant populations in the country. And when you talk to them, they're not actually worried about immigrants coming and working here. What they're worried about is people, immigrants coming here and just living off the state, and living off the benefit system. So they don't necessarily think that we don't want to encourage immigrants who we need, but what we do need to do is ensure that when they come here to work, they work, and when they aren't able to work, they have to leave the country. And I think in terms of immigration, that is, I, I think that is a, probably a, a, a pretty sound policy. I don't necessarily agree with Douglas with regard to introducing a Australian-based point system, because actually this country has already got a point system with regard to immigration, which actually categorises immigrants based on their skills and, and their wealth and such like. The Australian points based system is actually designed to encourage immigrants because Australia wants more immigrants. It doesn't want to turn them away. It's actually encouraging them. So I'm not sure that their system would actually work, work in this country where we actually we don't actually need more immigrants. Uh, we have a population large enough as it is at the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, can I have a question for the gentleman? Yes, I think it would be a mistake to um, conduct any referendum campaign fundamentally on economics only. And that, I think, is the tendency of almost all discussions about economics. And it always is a field in which it's very hard to get a settled opinion that I can convince others and others can convince me about. So I think there's another issue which is popular at the moment, and that is peace. Uh, any party that advocates coming out of the European Union is, in effect, a peace party is our entanglement with the European Union, which is drawing us into conflict with the, with the Russian Federation, it's injuring our trade already. Uh, it will introduce more problems, more trade problems, as the sanctions on Russia mount. So a peace party would um, be a powerful uh, thing with a lot of people in this country. They would understand that membership of the European Union, continued membership, entangles us with protecting the borders of the European Union and the mind of our political elite extends from the Atlantic to the Euros. And that's a huge danger to us to get involved. comments, which were very much uh, in tune with feeling in the meeting. Um, Gordon, have you got anything you specifically like to bring on this? Uh, I, can I just there's a couple of things we do. I, I do think that you're right, we, we shouldn't be fixated with the economic issue when it comes to winning the referendum. I think Lord Stoddart's point about sovereignty is yes. the most important issue. Uh, and we, that's what we should be ensuring that people understand, that we are slowly losing the power to govern ourselves. And that's a very, that's a, that will resonate. The other thing I would like to say with regard to the expansion of Europe, let's not Forget. I mean, let's remember where, where the British group came from. It came from a speech made by Margaret Thatcher uh, in 1988, uh, where she wasn't talking about withdrawing from Europe, as she was actually talking about re renegotiating the way our relationship with Europe uh, and changing the way in which we, we interface with Europe. 
And Margaret Thatcher was a big supporter of an expanded Europe. She thought an expanded Europe with Britain in it was actually a good thing for the country. So this isn't a new thing. Uh, and uh, just to bear in mind, you know, we, we have very fond members of Margaret Thatcher, uh, but she was actually, in many ways, pro-European. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just comment on that. Um, Margaret Thatcher put forward um, a strategy for nation states cooperating in the areas they could cooperate across Europe. And quite frankly, nobody else in Europe, the other government in Europe, was interested in that. And the Thatcher concept at Bruges was rejected. And Margaret's position, uh, which she set out in a book state draft in around 2003, was consider the position was that the European Union was unreformable. Unreformable. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I'm sure she would now, if she was here, be with us advocating that Britain left the European Union and fully exploited the talents, resources and abilities that the people of this country possess. Suggesting 
um, moving to a New Zealand type system, uh, what we could do though is have a, a farming policy that works for Britain. The problem at the moment is that we have a farming policy in Britain that is largely engineered in the interest of French farmers. Now, I, I have no hard feelings towards French farmers. In fact, French farmers, I, I'm very grateful to them. They make some of the best produce in the world. But I don't really think it's sensible for farmers in East Anglia to have to uh, comply, comply with policies that are largely designed for the interests of French farmers. So if we were outside the European Union, we could have a British farming policy for British farmers. I think it's quite innovative in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely into conservation. I think conservation is an incredibly important thing. I, I was a member of Friends of the Earth in, in my sins long before I was ever a conservative. I, I, I feel very strongly about conservation. But I think conservation needs to change and conservation needs to adapt. And conservation through <coughs> agriculture and uh, a good um, husbandry of the landscape is, is, is an incredibly important thing. I don't think we're getting the innovation in policy that we could have if we decided our own farming policy. When was the last time you heard a party going into general election saying, vote for us and we will offer you a different policy on agriculture? They can't, because we're in the EU. We need a British farming policy decided by those who elected Britain. Let's hear what it is now. Thank you very much. Can I take a question from the lady? I'm very worried about this vote for the best to leave the European Union. If you remember, Ireland had a vote and they voted to leave. And what happened? The European Union insisted they had another vote. And poured money in there, promised them everything, and changed the vote. I'm just wondering if our country is going to be quite so gullible and how we can stop this happening. I think we need to be a little bit more optimistic. Um, we're going to get the chance to vote to leave the European Union. We've got to trust the good judgment of millions of our compatriots. And I think uh, if, we, if we enter this referendum fearful of the outcome, fearful of the verdict of the people, then we're not going to win. But if we enter it in a spirit of, of democratic trust, of, of uh, yeah, I, I stood in elections once or twice myself. I, I don't fear them. I rather like them. They're rather invigorating. They're good fun. Um, I, I think we need to look forward to it and we need to relish it. Now, you're, you're certainly right that in, in Ireland, where people voted to reject further European integration, they nonetheless had it, had it foisted upon them. But I, I, I don't seriously imagine that even David Cameron, if there was a, a clear uh, vote to leave the European Union, not even David Cameron, could, 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 could overlook and ignore that position. The key is to make sure that we win the referendum. And that means a little bit of optimism, trust in the people, and, and maybe just lightening up a little bit. Yeah. We've got a whole generation of people who have never known this country as being outside the European Union. Yeah. We need to appeal to them in new ways, and we need to frame the debate in a way that is very, uh, resonates with people who listen to Spotify. If you don't know that, that, that that, that's a totally different way of listening to music. We, we've got to change the way we interact with voters. Um, I, I think you can, you can, as a party, is, is being to do this, and, and rather successfully. In, in, for example, in the, 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 the Clacton by-election, I'm digressing slightly, but uh, the support we got from 18 to 34 year olds was higher than amongst any other age group in the constituency. We can win with a, a, a different age group. We can win with younger voters. But it's going to require us to be a little bit more trusting, a little bit more optimistic, and uh, framing the debate in a, a slightly different way. Can I just say, and of course we've got to do it together. Yeah. You, know, you know, I will be standing shoulder to shoulder with Douglas at that referendum and Dave at that referendum. And that's the important thing. We've got to get all those people who are uh, Eurosceptic to do it together without any... Uh, it, it is non it is non party political. You know, we should be ensuring that everyone's putting together on it. And I'm more than happy to uh, to, to be short and short and don't. Thank you. Well just very briefly, I I think we can it's not going to be easy, don't make a mistake about that. The force is against us are tremendous. And of course, ladies uh, has raised a very important point. 
and the right to a little bit further than that, to remind ourselves that the French and the Netherlands voted against the Constitution. What did they do? They just called it another name, the Lisbon Treaty. And that enabled um, uh, our, our then Prime Minister, Mr. Blair, uh, to get out of his commitment to have a referendum on the Constitution. They were very tricky.
Um, I think it's appalling that we are sacrificing the prospect of tens of millions of Greeks to lead a prosperous uh, 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 life um, in order to rescue bankers from their own foolish investment decisions. The bankers chose to lend that money to a feckless government. But, you know, um, I asked David Cameron on the Federal House of Commons this week whether he still thought the euro should be maintained at any price. And it's extraordinary how the, the things we keep on being told are unthinkable by the political establishment suddenly do become thinkable. And I think uh, increasingly people are starting to recognize that Greece is going to have to default. Um, it would be bad news for, for bondholders who, who have all that worthless paper. Um, but it'll be good news for Greece. And I, I, I think it's absolutely wrong for our government to be siding with uh, big corporate banking interests against the interests of, of Greek people. Of course, most of our debt is now in the hands of the public sector. Conveniently, they've shuffled it from the banks to the tax banks. Yeah. If, 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 if Greece left the Eurozone, what do you think the impact would be on the remaining members of the Eurozone? I think if Greece were to leave that, you know, there are no good choices for Greece, it would, be, it would be difficult, but I think within a short space of time, the thing that the European uh, establishment really fears most of all. Um, is that Greece should leave the European Union and start to prosper. And if, 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 if Italy was to leave the European Union, I think Italy would do incredibly well. There are lots of medium and small-sized businesses in Italy that have global products with a global brand recognition who would do phenomenally well if Italy was to leave the European Union. So, I mean, I, I, I think Greece leaving, uh, they're resisting it at all costs in Europe precisely because they don't want Greece to thrive outside the European Union. Okay, time is pressing. I'll take two final questions. First of all, so the lady with the green top on the second back row there. Yes. Just here, forward, the second row from the back. I'm afraid my hands are rather dim and I can't see whether it's uh, somebody with a turquoise. It's a gentleman, isn't it? With a turquoise. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Before I, I, I say a few words of thanks to the panelists this evening, I'd like to tell you that our next meeting is on the 28th of May, uh, when we will have uh, Bernard Lucker, uh, the leader of the Alternative for Germany Party, to speak to us. Uh, I think this is going to be a very important meeting. Um, Germany is at the forefront of the developments and the conflicts that we see in Europe at the moment. And much of what is happening and the consequences for the German people have been kept from them. Uh, Bernard Lucke is probably the most honest uh, politician in Germany, and he poses a considerable threat to the consensus that exists there. Um, he is also, I believe, very much a part of the arguments that we are putting forward regarding the lack of viability of this union for the future. So it will be a good opportunity to talk to him, ask questions, find the common ground, and also will be making major efforts for the media to cover uh, his visit to me. Our speakers tonight have covered a huge ground and a wide variety of questions. And I think what stands out from this evening is their total sincerity. They are all politicians, but we do not have enough politicians like the three we have on the back for tonight. They are people of honesty, integrity, and people that have thought deeply about all of these issues and are prepared to put forward alternatives and defend them. We are truly grateful for the open debate that they have brought here this evening. And I have total confidence that if we have people like this at the forefront of our campaign, we will indeed succeed and leave the European Union. Thank you, speakers.